Well, thanks very much indeed. It's a great privilege to present this selective overview of precision medicine studies and advanced non-small cell lung cancer at this forum. I'm going to start this particular selective, and it's obviously selective because we've got 20 minutes overview, with the National Lung Matrix Study. Now, when I can get this to work, the National Lung Matrix Study. Um, the reason I'm starting with this particular program is this is a study that's just initiated in the UK. It's going to be run out of all 18 experimental cancer medicine centres. It's the largest precision medicine study in lung cancer and possibly in all cancers globally at the moment. And actually the reason I'm starting with it is because it's actually the simplest trial design of all of them. Okay? So let's have a look at the trial design. Essentially what the National Lung Matrix trial is, is an umbrella study of multiple single arm phase 2 signal of activity studies where we're teaming up the molecular abnormality that we're picking up in the patient's tumour, which we think is oncogenically pertinent, together with the targeted therapy of choice, okay, to see whether we can get some activity, with the end point being objective response rate. We're actually doing the genotyping in this study with a 28 gene adaptive panel, which has been developed by Illumina. It's a next generation sequencing panel. So it's a very straightforward design. We pick up the oncogenic driver, we team that up with the targeted therapy of choice, and then we look to see whether there's objective responses in this. And this is a small scale study for each of these arms. We're testing sort of 30 patients to see if we can get a big hit for all these patients with their particular targeted therapy. Now there's two very important parts of this design. The first one is this umbrella design because very often when you're doing biomarker drug combination studies you pick one biomarker, one drug and if you've got a very small molecular cohort it's very very uneconomical in terms of time and money to screen them. In other words if you've got a 2 or 3% cohort in a particular disease you have to screen 100 patients to pick up 2 patients. Okay? What's much much more sensible is to do an umbrella study. In other words instead of just looking at one biomarker and teaming out with one drug you look at a whole tranche of different biomarkers with a number of drugs. That makes it much more economical in terms of testing, in terms of time and money and of course for patients that's much better. Instead of them being disappointed because there wasn't one or two patients that had that out of a hundred, there's a much larger chance in an umbrella study that will actually be given a targeted agent of choice. So that's a big advantage to this. The other big advantage is this one on the bottom there is this trial is carried out under a single clinical trial protocol and regulatory submission. Again, if you've got somebody who's sitting there one evening and there's a light bulb moment about putting together a new drug with a new biomarker, they're going to have to go and get funding, write the protocol. It takes absolutely forever to get that trial running. What this study does is it's adaptive. It allows somebody to come to us as a trial unit, and this is being run out of Birmingham trial unit, to come to us with a new idea. And if the preclinical data looks good for this, it's passed through our international peer review panel and our trial management group, and we all think this looks good, we can bring that into the trial via a substantial amendment. Okay. That takes 35 days for the MHRA. That makes it really, really flexible and nimble. In other words, instead of sort of thinking of an idea and then three years down the line getting the trial started, we can actually get it started quickly as a substantial amendment, as a new trial, a new arm in the particular trial. So what I want to do now is to take you through what the National Lung Matrix trial looks like at the current time. And you're going to see three grids, okay? This, if you like, is the matrix, okay? So there's three grids here. And along the top, and if I hope you can see that, along the top are the drugs that we've got in the lineup at current time, okay? We're looking at more drugs at the moment, but these are the ones that we've got ready to go, good to go, in the study, which, as I say, is already initiated. So we've got eight drugs along the top, and then down the side there, you've got the cohorts, the molecular changes that we're teaming up with a particular target therapy of choice. Okay, So looking along the top, you can see there's quite a few of them with AZD in front of them. And that's because there's a lot of AstraZeneca drugs in here. We've also got two of Pfizer's drugs in here, palbocyclib and crizotinib. But this has been a really, really fruitful collaboration between AstraZeneca and Pfizer and Cancer Research UK that have come together to design this screening platform, which we're calling SMP2, this 28 gene next generation sequencing platform, but also to get these drugs in. It's been critically important that we can get access to the drugs. And both AstraZeneca AstraZeneca and Pfizer have been really good in giving the UK oncologists and particularly our patients access to these targeted therapies. And if we go along the top from left to right, first of all we've got 5363, that's AZD 5363, that's AstraZeneca's AKT inhibitor. Then we've got 4547, which is AstraZeneca fibroblastic growth factor receptor inhibitor. Then we've got AZD 2014 which is their mTORC1, mTORC2 inhibitor. We've then got Pfizer's palbocyclib, which is a cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6 inhibitor. We've got crizotinib, which many of you will know is actually an ALK inhibitor, which is used to treat EML4 out fusion disease, but it's also got other targets as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. Then we've got AZD9291, which is AstraZeneca's T790M inhibitor, which I'll explain in a second. Then we've got um, the one towards the end there, we've got selumetinib and docetaxel. Selumetinib is AstraZeneca's MEK inhibitor, 
Jupiter. And then finally, on the very right hand of the panel there, we've got Medi4736, which is Medi for the Immune and AstraZeneca's anti pdl one monoclonal antibody. So now what I'm going to do is to take you through each of the arms and each of the drugs to give you a little bit of the preclinical and biochemical rationale for why we're teaming these up. Okay? So I want to start over on the left-hand side of the panel, which is AZD5363, which is the AKT inhibitor. And you can see there where the ticks are against the boxes, we've got a number of different cohorts. Okay? You can see mostly they're squamous cell lung cancer, that's SCC, because these are the ones that have most of the abnormalities which are pertinent to this particular arm. So you can see here we've got separate arms for those with ticks. 3CA mutations, PIK3CA amplifications, loss of P10, mutation of P10, and also AKT1 mutations. This is intuitively what you'd expect. All of these abnormalities will activate AKT, so the use of an AKT inhibitor obviously makes good sense, and I'll come back to this a bit later on. The second column there is 4547, which is the FGFR inhibitor. And you can see that what we're treating in this particular arm is patients with mutations in FGFR 2 or 3. We are not treating patients with FGFR amplifications. The reason for that is there's already data out there that suggests that this drug is not particularly active in amplification patients. So why do we think it might be active in mutation patients? Well, there's already a very good paradigm in lung cancer of this. We know, for example, that patients who've got a mutation of the epidermal growth factor receptor are very highly sensitive to epidermal growth factor receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Whereas those patients with EGFR amplifications, that's not a positive predictive biomarker. There's a big difference between amplifications and mutations, and this is why we're testing this separately here. Then if we look at the third drug that I want to talk about, which is 2014, this is this mTORC1, mTORC2 inhibitor. A lot of mTOR inhibitors are actually just mTORC1 inhibitors, which is not good because what happens when you inhibit mTORC1 is you activate AKT via phosphorylation of serine 473, and that is mediated through mTORC2. So much better is to use a combined mTORC1, mTORC2 inhibitor, which is exactly what 2014 is. It's very, very active actually in a number of different cellular contexts, which I'll talk about. We've got two Two very interesting cohorts that we're treating with 2014. We've got those patients with TSC1 and TSC2 mutations. It's not particularly common, makes up about 3% of small uh, squamous cell lung cancer, but a very, very interesting target. So TSC1 and TSC2, that's the tuberous sclerosis complex. TSC1 and 2 form a heterodimer, and in that heterodimer, that represents a GTPase activating protein. And the actual molecule that it does its work on is RHEB. Okay? Now, when you lose TSC1 or TSC2, TSC2 activity through mutation, you activate our head because it, it becomes uh, constitutively activated in its GTP bound form. And our head is the direct activator of mTOR. In other words, when we lose TSC1 or TSC2 activity, we activate mTOR, so we use an mTORC1, mTORC2 inhibitor. It makes sense, okay? And in fact, there's already very good preclinical data with this. It's these cells, TSC1 or TSC2 mutant cells, are highly sensitive to the activity of 2014. And there was a very, very interesting report in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of months ago of a patient with anaplastic thyroid cancer that had gone through chemo radiation and surgery and relapsed, then went on to a phase one study of Everolimus, an mTOR inhibitor, and actually had an 18-month response to this, an unbelievable response. They went and looked at this patient to see what the actual abnormality was that was predicting that response, and that patient turned out to have a TSC2 mutation. So we're quite excited about using this mTORC1, mTORC2 inhibitor in these TSC1, TSC2 mutants. Then the other group, which is a much bigger group, where we're using this drug is those with LKB1 mutations. So this is not uncommon in lung cancer. Why are we using 2014 in these? Well, in fact, LKB1 mutation phenocopies TSC2 mutation. Okay? So LKB1 sits upstream of a molecule called AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase, which becomes activated in situations of cellular energy stress when AMP goes up, for example, with low glucose. And that activation of AMPK is driven by LKB1. But the critical thing is AMP AMPK activates TSC2. So when you lose LKB1, you lose AMPK activation, you lose TSC2 activation, you activate mTOR via RHEB activation, and therefore again, using 2014 in that group makes a lot of sense. Then the fourth drug that we're using here is palbocyclib. So this is um, Pfizer's cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6 inhibitors. And you can see there's four different cohorts that we're using there. They're the four bottom ones down there. 
The first three, again, are really quite intuitive, okay? So, for example, in squamous cell lung cancer, many patients lose CDKN2A. They have homozygous deletion of the CDKN2A gene. Now, this encodes P16, which is a very important molecule. P16 inhibits the dimer of CDK4 and cyclin D1, okay? That's very important. So when you lose P16 through CDKN2A loss, you then lose inhibition of CDK4 cyclin D1, and that causes phosphorylation of RB, causing the cells to go into cell cycles. So in patients that have lost P16 through CDKN2A inhibi um, loss, then we're actually going to be treating those patients with the CDK4-6 inhibitor. Again, making sense, those patients that have got amplification of CDK4 and amplification of cyclin D1, again, that will phosphorylate RB. So again, using that uh, CDK4-6 inhibitor palbocyclin makes a lot of sense in these patients. The bottom one here, is those patients with adenocarcinoma of the lungs with KRAS mutations. Now, this represents quite a large cohort. This is 25% of lung cancer. So if we had a decent drug for this, that would be really, really good. And we're using palbocyclib in this group. Why are we doing this? Well, there's some very interesting data published by Mariano Barbacy's group a couple of years ago, which showed that CDK4 knockdown was synthetically lethal with KRAS mutant adenocarcinoma of the lung completely specific to lung cancer. It didn't occur, for example, in KRAS mutated colon or KRAS mutated pancreas. It was completely specific for lung. And what was happening in these cells was that the knockdown of CDK4, which obviously you can achieve through the CDK4-6 inhibitor, was causing the reinduction of KRAS-driven oncogene-induced senescence. So we're using that particular drug in that particular arm. Now, if we come across to the last half of it here, we've got crizotinib here. I've already said that this is well known as an ALK inhibitor used in EML4 ALK fusion disease, but it's also a very potent MET and ROS inhibitor. And again, we've got separate cohorts of high amplification MET that we're going to be treating with crizotinib and those patients with ROS fusions as well. If we look to the third to last one there, AZD9291, this is this T790M inhibitor. Now we know that patients who have got EGFR mutations respond really nicely to EGFR TKIs, but they all become resistant. And when you biopsy these patients, about 50 to 60% of these will have picked up the secondary gatekeeper mutation, T790M, where threonine gets switched to a methionine, that's uh, code on 790. And methionine is a big bulky residue, so it causes steric hindrance and prevents the inhibitor from binding. 9291 is a specific T790M inhibitor. So those patients have got EGFR mutant disease and become resistant to their EGFR TKI. They will have a repeat biopsy and if they've picked up the T790M as the gatekeeper mutation, which is driving that resistance, then we're going to be using that particular drug. Finally, we've got the combination of selumetanib, which is this MEK inhibitor, together with docetaxel. And we've got two interesting cohorts. One is NRAS and one is NF1 mutations. And NF1 mutations are not uncommon and a very interesting potential tumour suppressor, which is knocked out in a number of lung cancers. Now, NF1, like TSC12, is one of these GAPs, these GTP-activating proteins. And actually what gets activated when you lose NF1 is RAS. So loss of NF1 activates RAS. And we already know from data that's been published uh, by uh, Pazarez that, in fact, the combination of selumetanib and docetaxel compared with docetaxel alone is much more active in KRAS mutant non-small cell lung cancer uh, than docetaxel alone. In other words, much better response rate, much better PFS. And this is being tested currently in a phase three. So we're using this combination of the MET inhibitor and docetaxel in these patients with NF1 mutations because this basically phenocopies RAS mutation, exactly the same as the situation with NRAS. And in fact, ASCO last year, there was some very interesting data in patients who have got NF1 germline loss, who developed plexiform neurofibromas, who were treated with a MEK inhibitor cellumetanib as a single agent, and every single one of those adolescents responded to that treatment with a 61% response rate overall. And then finally, right at the end, we've got MEDI4736. This is this anti pdl one monoclonal antibody. So those patients that have gone successfully through the screen, there's no actionable change at all, they will be treated with PDL1. DL1, okay? In other words, it's almost a basket study for those with no actionable change. And we've been using these PDL1 blockers for a quite a long time now in lung cancer, and I can tell you they're the most amazing thing. You have some patients that are actively progressing with chemo resistant lung cancer, having fantastic responses to these drugs simply because you are activating their own immune system, allowing their own T cells to work. It's been a very exciting thing.
So just my last sort of five minutes really, what's been the rationale for the single arm design? Why haven't we done a randomised study for example? Well what we're interested in this study is the big hitters. We want another gefitinib in EGFR mutant disease, we want another crizotinib in EML4 ALK disease. Okay? Very recently again in the New England Journal of Medicine there was some data published on crizotinib in those patients with rod fusion lung cancer. There was a 72% response rate with a 19% median progression free survival in these patients. You you do not need a randomised trial to tell you that that drug works. And what we're looking for here is the big hitters. We want another crizotinib, we want another gefitinib. This is why we're going for these single signal of activity studies in this. The other thing that's very important about this is this large scale screening. We're looking to screen 2,000 patients a year. And this allows us to do discrete biomarker testing, which I'll explain what I mean in a minute. But of course, this study has to be based on really good, strong preclinical data. So if we just look at this discrete biomarker drug cohort issue, again, this is 5363, and I've told you already, we're looking at these multiple separate cohorts, PIX3CA mutation, amplification, P10 loss, P10 mutation. Why aren't we all sticking them all together and just testing all of them as reasons for AKT activation? Well, for two reasons. It seems pretty unlikely that a PIX3ASA mutant patient will have exactly the same response rate as, say, a P10 loss patient. And if we stick them all together, we'll lose the granularity of that activity in the separate cohorts. But much more importantly, what we're very interested in is mechanisms resistance. In other words, when patients who have had a good response progress on these targeted therapies, we'll be biopsying them again to understand the mechanisms of resistance. And again, it's very unlikely that a patient that's responded to 5363 with a PIX3CA mutation will become resistant in exactly the same way as, say, a patient with a P10 loss. And if we stick more together, again, we'll lose the granularity of this. What about this issue of the preclinical data? We've been very, very careful to make sure that the abnormalities that we're teaming up with the targeted therapies are pertinent. I've already said in the FGFR arm, for example, we're not treating amplification patients, but we're taking it one step further. So in the FGFR arm with the 4547, we are only treating certain of the mutations, okay? Only those ones that we know from data that's already published that are specifically transforming and tumorigenic in nude mice. In other words, just the mutations in yellow in the extracellular binding domain of the FGFR or in the green region there, which is the intracellular tyrosine kinase domain. We know that the ones in grey, the transmembrane spanning region or the ones at the end, do not transform. So we are looking at the FGFR mutations and only treating those patients with the mutations in either that extracellular binding domain or the intracellular tyrosine kinase domain with this. And we already know from data that's out there that these particular transforming and tumorigenic mutants are highly sensitive to the use of 4547. The other very important thing, we've been very careful about molecular exclusion rules, okay? So we're not just treating everybody with a particular mutation, we're being very specific about the ones we treat. So for example, in the 5363 arm where we're treating these PIX3CA, P10 and AKT mutations, we are excluding patients with concomitant KRAS mutations. Why are we doing that? Well, we know from the cell line work that KRAS mutation is a negative predictive biomarker for the activity of 5363 and for the reason for that is that there is convergent regulation of the translational repressor 4 ebp one by both AKT activation and MEK activation. And this is why we're not treating patients with KRAS mutation who have got uh, PIX3CA or P10 or AKT mutations with 5363. And then finally, we've also got this KRAS mutant palbocyclib arm, this CDK4-6 inhibitor, the synthetic lethal story there. We are not treating patients who've got concomitant PIX3CA or P10 or LKB1 or TSC1-2 abnormalities in that arm. The reason for that is that there's very nice data from Owen Sansom's group that show if you get AKT1 activation, mTOR activation, that abrogates KRAS-induced oncogene-induced senescence. And of course, this is what we're trying to re-establish with the use of the cdk <coughs> Four, six inhibitor, so those patients will be excluded from that particular arm. I've got one minute, so I'm going to talk really quickly for the last three slides. This obviously isn't the only study that's going on at the moment. We're, obviously, there's a couple of randomised studies. I've already said that we're doing single arm studies because we're looking for the big hitters. Randomised studies are always felt to be attractive because you can tease out the prognostic and predictive, and there are one or two very good studies going on at the moment. The first one that I just want to briefly talk about is SAFIA 2, which is a French study here. It's a very nice study. It's basically a maintenance study. So patients with non-small cell lung cancer on their first line chemotherapy will have their biopsies tested. They're actually using a 50 uh, gene next generation sequencing panel and a 75 gene array CGH. And then according to the molecular abnormality, those patients that have got stabilisation of their disease after four to six cycles will be randomised two to one to either stand
standard of care maintenance therapy, such as pemetrexid in non-squamous lung cancer, or if, they, or if they go into the target arm, they will receive the targeted therapy of choice. Okay? And you'll see some familiar names there. You've got selumetinib there, which we've got 2014, 4547, 5363. They've got another couple of other drugs. They've got AZD8931, which is a panherb inhibitor, and vandetanib, which inhibits EGFR, VEGF, and RET as well. And it's a very interesting question they're asking. They're asking the question, if we put, sorry, can you take me back one, please? If we randomise patients to a targeted therapy of choice, picked by the virtue of their molecular abnormality that's been picked up on that panel, um, or randomise them to standard of care, do they do better with a targeted therapy of choice? A very important <coughs> basic conceptual question. So basically, if we look at the genes blocks we've got in common, there are many genes that are in common that we're looking at in the matrix study, together with the SAFIR-2 study, a whole range of AKT, PIX3CA, STK11, TSE12, FGFR, NRAS, KRAS. So these are things that are in common with these two. And again, we've got things that are common, this is my last slide here, with the lung map study. This is an American study in squamous cell lung cancer. This again is a randomised study where patients are randomised to either second-line chemotherapy or the targeted therapy of choice, again picked up according to the molecular abnormalities. And again, you've got some familiar suspects there. They've got patients with FGFR mutations and amplifications being randomised to either docetaxel or the FGFR inhibitor 4547. Again, they've got cyclin-dependent kinase uh, abnormalities, CD, CCND1, CDK4 amplifications. Again, they're being randomised to either docetaxel or palbocyclib. Again, they're looking at PIX3CA mutations, this time to a PIX3CA inhibitor or docetaxel. And again, they've got this basket of those patients with no actionable change where they're being randomised to the PDL1 antibody or to chemotherapy. And you can see that we've been in a situation where we're going to have these three big studies looking at very similar sort of molecular abnormalities, different designs. And we can all really come together, I think, to put all this data together. And this is a final quote from Fabrice Balazi, who's actually running the uh, CEFA 2 study, to actually bring bring all this data together, put it all together, and in a few years' time we can collaborate to really understand what are the drivers of these patients' tumours and really understand what the right personalised medicines for them are. And I think lung cancer has undergone a total revolution over the last 10 years from one of complete nihilism to one of real excitement. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.